Hey, Tony. See you. You too. So, Joe, you are a designer, a good designer, a proper designer from RISD, as we know, one of the best. And at the beginning of this conference, we did a question was put that traditionally, or not long ago, designers, the creative types, could never really be trusted running a business. I think you've proved everybody wrong there. But I think it's important to establish that both you and Brian, and Brian, mm -hmm. both, both graduated from RISD. At the time when you started Airbnb, I remember you telling us that to get any kind of funding in Silicon Valley, you were kind of looked at a bit weirdly if you didn't have majority engineers. You went in two designers and one engineer, and that has now changed. That's right. I, th I think it's also worth calling out that we live at this intersection of art and science. So Brian and I obviously have creative backgrounds. We both study design, out of product sense, and also graphic design on my end. And then, of course, Nate is our third co-founder, who uh, you could say is the, the pragmatist of the three of us. He's the computer science graduate from Harvard and is the guy that's constantly pulling things back in to, to ground them and say, OK, well, the, the brilliant future and brilliant vision, what are we shipping tomorrow? Yeah. Um, so it, it, it absolutely is a balance of the, the kind of the big, high-minded, you know, visionary, wow, what, what can we dream of that doesn't exist yet, grounded in the reality of, of what can we make practical today. So you have that perfect combination. I think it absolutely does take that. And design thinking, you know, the subject that's um, plaguing us a little bit these few days, but in a good way, in a very good way. I'm a convert, actually. I used to think it, I used to think it was a lot of hogwash, but now I think it's actually, you know, it's good. It's having a comeback. Um, <laughs> Well, I think like design thinking is part of the equation. To me, that's the strategic yeah. thinking. That's the, the plan that you make. That's the how do you account for the customer? How do you think about the layer between you and whatever you're designing or the technology and then the person accessing that technology? But you absolutely need the other half of that, which in my mind is like design making or design doing. Like, I think our company is just an example of that. Like, we have really big ideas of how to use design to connect people around the world, ground in the reality of, okay, we need to actually make and ship this thing. Yeah. So again, the combination. And how do you apply it to design thinking to scaling the business, which of course is, is what you've successfully done? Ah, man, this is like one of the greatest challenges, right? Because uh, you care so much about the quality of the, the service that you deliver to a customer. And as a, a, any business scales, there's sort of, you know, the law of large numbers is working against you mm -hmm. because you want to make things more efficient and trim corners here. And that extra little flourish that you added that you know, wasn't very measurable, but certainly brought a smile to a customer. And it was just different enough from the other guy, the other offering on the market. Those things start to get trimmed. And I think if you're not careful, you end up with a product that is just, you know, ho-hum or mediocre or kind of run of the mill. Mm. And so there's this constant tension that anybody who has any company that offers a service to a customer experiences as you begin to scale it. And I think, you know, the great companies, you know, will fight for that. They will, they will hold their ground and say, you know what, maybe this little part isn't that measurable, but we believe in this. Um, it's an expression of our values, of our brand. And uh, we're, we're going to try to keep the, the high quality as we go for high scale. Yes. I mean, it's mesmerizing and never ceases to amaze me and many others that you can design such a platform that reaches so many different geographies and cultures. That's a, I think that's a skill that is... Well, I often tell candidates when they're thinking about joining <clears throat> our design team that um, it's, a, it's a one of a kind design challenge. At the base layer, you've got all the challenges of a two sided marketplace where you've got a guest and a host and you have to figure out how to connect them. And marketplaces, by the way, are like one of the hardest businesses to do on the internet. On top of that, though, it's not just a marketplace, there's a behavior change quality to this, which is, you know, 10 years ago when we first started, people were not staying in people's homes at scale. Right? This was a new behavior that. Uh, we needed to figure out how to introduce to people and walk them across the, the bridge of, okay, I have this mental model of traditional accommodations that I've stayed in for many years, and now you want me to try this home with someone I've never met in a neighborhood I'm not familiar with. Yeah. Um, it's all the classic uh, behavior change principles. It'll never work. It'll never work. I, I heard that a couple times. <laughs> um, so on top of that, then you have to figure out how to do it in 191 countries yep. across and be culturally sensitive and, and relevant no matter where you are in the world. And then moving forward, um, you have the clicker, Joe. Oh. Yeah. Um, some new initiatives. Well, initiatives you've been uh, applying re recently, but you're going to share with us some extraordinary projects. I'd love to. Which is exciting. Well, I, th I think just to, to tee this off, I'd say 
I feel like a, a company that's operating at this time in history, in the 21st century, has a responsibility to go beyond the call of the day-to-day -day business. And to me, it's, it's more than, than writing a check or, or cutting a grant to an organization. It's actually taking whatever it is that you're good at as a company, whatever your DNA is, your strengths, your core competencies, and actually going out into the world and solving for problems that could benefit from whatever your internal talents are. And so for us, we have three things that we think we're really good at, which is experts in short-term hospitality. Uh, we're experts at de deploying scalable internet software around the globe. Um, and we're experts at, at community building and building trust between people who've never met. And so with that in mind, the, the question that we started to ask is, where could those assets, those strengths, be applied out in the world? And there was this graph that one of my software engineers showed me that shows the number of forcibly displaced people worldwide. And about two years ago, it was a radical number of 65 million. But what really blew my mind was in 2044, basically the population of the United States will be forcibly displaced due to climate change, political conflict, et cetera. Um, this number's from the UNHCR, by the way. And I, I saw this graph, and this was one of those moments where you kind of have these, these you know, tectonic shifts in your worldview, and you're like, wait a second. Um, that's quite a dramatic, that's a, that's a graph that's terrifying. It's, it's absolutely terrifying. I mean, I would hope that we've created a brand that can endure through 2044 and beyond. Um, and so we're gonna be around for this number to keep growing. And I think the question that we asked and I posed to my team was, what could we do, you know? Uh, is there anything that we could do to put a dent in this somehow, if at all? And so we have a team that's now dedicated at the company to help figuring out how we repurpose what we're good at to help those who need it the most. And another inspiration here was in 2012 when Hurricane Sandy hit New York City, tens of thousands of people went from homefulness to homelessness overnight. We get this email from one of our hosts named Shell in Brooklyn, and she says to us, hey Airbnb, I've got these five guest rooms. How do I volunteer these to those who have been displaced? At the time, you had to have a payment to make a connection, but we're like, why? Yeah. So we put a team together, and almost overnight, they re reconfigured our entire platform to allow hosts like Shell to volunteer their places. So in a couple of days, we had a close to 1,000 hosts in New York City. So this is just a genuine reach out from one of your hosts. An idea from one of our super yes, hosts exactly. at Shell. And after we got through that um, and helped people, we said, well, obviously this is not the last natural disaster. Mm. What if there were other people like Shell all over the world who would love to help out in a time of need? So we developed a platform uh, called Open Homes. And this is a way for our host to put a roof over the head of people who need one the most. Uh, and it's, it's all basically volunteer based of people who see images on TV and say like, wow, that, that earthquake or that hurricane or that typhoon, um, what could I as one person possibly do to help make an impact? Yeah. And finally, we, I, we were offering something that's not about writing the check, it's just about sharing the extra bedroom down the hall. Um, and so we made a big commitment last year to help, house, help our hosts house 100,000 people who've been displaced over the next five years. And, um, to me, this is just like, I, I see it as a responsibility of, of our company and um, certainly there are other examples of plenty of other companies that are also doing good in the world that go beyond just, just writing checks. Um, one of the things that we've learned from this now that it's been deployed, uh, it's been active in over 90 different disasters in over 20 countries worldwide. And um, one of the things we've learned is that there's this generosity in the host community yep. to give back. Why do we have to wait for hurricane season to tap into that? What are the topics on a daily basis that our host could be volunteering their rooms for. And so we circled back to the, the topic of forcibly displaced uh, refugees. And we're now active in, in a couple of countries like Italy, Greece, Canada, the United States to help sa families who are being resettled uh, in this gap period from the time they land at the airport to the time they find permanent housing. There's this really funky period from weeks to months where they kind of bounce around and they're not really settled. Sure. And so what better way to welcome into a country than uh, by- So this is a host? Uh, that's actually a guest, okay, okay. Yeah, who uh, is a family of four from Iraq, stayed with the host in Denver. And a quick story there, um, basically the hosts not only just provided a home, but helped their kids get into school, helped him find a job. Um, they enrolled the neighbors to provide free laptops to the kids, wow. driving back and forth to job interviews. So it's much more than just about a home. When you mm. connect somebody uh, through an it's area- a community. Host, yeah, you get, you get involved in a community, which is incredibly important. So. There's another big topic that's going on in the world that we decided to get involved in, and it's the topic of population decline in Japan. Um, this is another really scary stat, um, where 
the biggest impact of this number is that rural areas are getting hit the hardest. I was in a village near a, t a, village, a town called Kaga about a year ago. Seven out of the eight homes in this village were completely empty. Uh, this is a real problem where populations are aging off and young generations are moving to cities where the jobs are. Um, so we had an idea. Uh, actually, let me take that back. One of our hosts had an Again, idea. Again, yeah. The hosts um, are having ideas. So I, actually, we have a quick video that I'd love to play to share a story from one of our hosts in rural Japan. もう たくさん協力してくれて、たくさんいろんなものを持ってきてくれて。エアビーエンビーのホストを始めました。今は世界中から旅人が来ます。旅をしていく生活に入っていくような形で過ごしていってもらいます。何よりも娘の明かりの世界
we designed and paid for the house and gifted it to them. They provided the land for it to be on. And it actually represents a whole new model in a sense as well. The whole first floor that you see here is both the guest's kitchen, living room, dining room on Airbnb, and it's also the community center for the village. Community center is a very important part of, of Japanese village life. And so think about this. We understand why people use our service is because you want to you connect with the locality, the place of where you are. And what we've learned is one of the fastest ways to do that is to meet somebody who lives there. And so imagine you're, you come, you arrive at the Yoshina house with your roller bags, and you open the sliding doors. And inside is the smell of some green tea on the stove. And there's people in your living room because you're literally sharing this with the village. So we can short circuit the connection of the time that it takes to meet a local. And so the, who will you meet in the Yoshino Cedar House? You'll meet the washi paper makers, the gentleman who runs the local sake brewery, the woman who runs the local chopstick factory. You'll meet the, the sushi chef. Uh, it's a town full of craftspeople. And so this whole first floor is meant to be a place to congregate and create that kind of community. So it's the original concept of sharing and meeting in a community, but on a bigger scale because it's the, it's the town's community center as well. So you're meeting everybody there. there. Yeah. That's right. That's right. So um, it's, it's an experiment in architecture. Um, there's also Go Hasegawa did a really beautiful thing. There's a small subtle detail here, which is the front porch is what's called an anagawa, which is an architectural detail that goes back a few hundred years in Japan which is basically a public bench that becomes a part of a house. So it becomes a signal to invite people who are passing by to, to rest, to, get, to take some shade from the sun, to maybe grab a tea. And so the whole first floor is meant to be a metaphorical enagawa to invite people in. And it's situated right on the beautiful river in Yoshino. Um, and there's a beautiful sidewalk where people come and go every day. So let's take a look on the inside. This is upstairs Ooh. in the guest room. Can I stay there? <laughs> So we actually have some stats. We're almost a year into the installation of the home, and we decided we should do an economic impact study to see the actual effect of this, see if our thesis was playing out. Um, so we have some preliminary results that have come in. Hot off the press. Hot off the press. An hour ago. So this space had a 70% occupancy rate over the last 11 months or so, which is incredibly high. That's good. Um, it's booked most of the week. Um, it's run, but there's no individual host here. So it actually flips our model on its head. Mm. There's actually a community collective that formed and becomes a collective host here, which means that the proceeds of a guest stay go back into the village. They go back into whatever they decide they want to spend it on. Um, so there was $50,000 $50, of total economic impact of the Oshino Cedar House in 2017. And then the lift of just creating a, a a hub like this for people to even learn, like, what does it mean to be a host on Airbnb? Um, there's $150,000 of total economic impact on all listings in the Yoshino area. And the total estimated economic impact over the next five years is set out to be $750,000. Um, and that equates to over 70 jobs supported in this village just as a result of this. Um, one other thing to note is that in Japan, there's upwards of around 8 million empty homes throughout the entire country and 700 in the Yoshino alone. So, this is really meant to be a beachhead and a lighthouse to show what does it mean to be a host. Yes. <laughs> and hopefully um, what we've seen is the ripple effect of people repurposing these empty homes in Yoshino and turning them into... And you homes. think there will be a, a ripple effect? There will be more of these This will, as the message gets out? That's the main idea is that, you know, it's, this is one small village in southern Japan with one home. This, we're, not, we're not in the business of designing homes at scale. This is meant to create a case study so that any village anywhere throughout the rest of Japan could look at this and say, oh, wow, maybe we can take from this model and import this into our village. And sure enough, we've had um, a fair amount of reach out since the project went live. In fact, there was a reach out from, oh, this is downstairs. So this is the, the community table on the bottom. It must um, smell good as well, cedarwood. Oh, I, wish that, I wish that would come through in the photos. Um, I mean, imagine. We have scratch and sniff, <laughs> brainstorm? No. Next year. The whole downstairs is cedar, the upstairs is cypress, and it's remarkable when you go inside just the sensorial experience mm. of wood 360 degrees around you. You can literally stand on the porch and almost see like, the forest of where all the wood came from. Um, I had a chance to go there myself, uh, an amazing dinner. Uh, the whole village turned up. Um, it was just an incredibly social experience. And, um, I'm laughing hard because it's like, 
this concept that we had the year earlier was actually playing out in front of me. Um, it was, it was you look happy. <laughs> that's a project that's been resolved. So um, we put this out into the world. We didn't know what was going to happen. And we get a phone call from another village that was halfway around the planet. Oh. Coming up next, um, if you want to learn more about it, you can go to yoshinocedarhouse.com. One of the rooms rents for $178 a night. And again, all the proceeds go back into the village. Um, that's a shot in the daytime. Just go Haskata, did an amazing job. So the call from around the world came from Europe. We get a call from Italy. It's this little town called Civita, which is just north of Rome. It's a 3,000 year old village. And the population has dwindled to just 10 people. So we, they call us and they say, we love what you did in Yoshino. We would love to incorporate the principles and the case study into our village here in Chivita. So we said, sure, this sounds great. So we worked with the village, all 10 people. <laughs> and we redesigned one of their empty homes, one of the empty rooms, into what we call Casa de Artista. And this was a collaboration with local artisans, local interior designers, local architects to repurpose an abandoned space, turn it into um, a beautifully you know, warm environment that we could then list on our platform and really just leverage our platform to create awareness for this tiny village, right? And that's the whole idea. It's like you've got Yoshino, you've got Chivita, and all the others, these other rural places around the world that exist and have beautiful things to offer, great culture to experience. They're just really hard to find. We happen to have a platform with an audience of over 100 million travelers that we can do something like this and suddenly broadcast to an audience that would love to stay in a, a tiny rural Italian village. Um, so all the proceeds of a guest stay go back into the Cultural Restoration Fund. And Tony, guess who the host is? Tell me. It's the mayor. <laughs> <laughs> One of nine. Yes. <laughs> yes. Tenth, the mayor. Right. The mayor is the host. Well, that's extraordinary. Your timing is extraordinary as well. I mean, we have two minutes left. If there are any questions from the floor, there are. There is a question here. I'm not supposed to do that. The uh, the paddle waver will find you. Mm. Please say your name, sir. Hi, it's Alan Murray. I I, I haven't. I, I got stopped at the tree costing as much as a Lamborghini. <laughs> so how, how much money did you have to spend for the uh, for the cedar wood for that house? <laughs> it was it was a fair <laughs> investment. I think they they gave us a. Uh, the price at cost, maybe. But it was a worthwhile investment. <laughs> what was that? <laughs> Any more hands? For anybody who just loves craftsmanship, like it's, it's worth a day in Yoshino. It really is just a remarkable place. You go into these, these wood shops, and you talk to woodworkers who, there's like six or seven generations of woodworkers in this one village. It's incredible. If there are no more questions, just one from me. Jo this area of, it's like a modern model of philanthropy, particularly the open homes one. Um, is that an area you're naturally edging towards or you're spinning a few plates at the moment? Um, well, I've got that team, we call it the human team, short for humanitarian, um, who's building out open homes and taking some of our best software engineers, some of our best designers that are working on, you know, how do you make it easy to find a home to take a vacation? Taking that same technology and saying, how do you make it easy to find a home when you're displaced? Um, and then I have another group in the company called Samara. It's their in-house design Samara, studio. Samara, yes, of course. That's right. And Samara's really thinking about what's next for Airbnb. Um, Ten years ago, no one would have predicted that people be sharing homes at the rates that they are today to the point where on, on New Year's Eve alone, there were three million people. This was your highest figure. Staying in homes on a single night in about 160 plus countries. I still think it'll never work, though, Joe, honestly. <laughs> no, Joe Gebbia, Airbnb, thank you so thank much. You, it's a fantastic. Thank you, Thank you so much.